What's up, CCDA? I'm Randy Neighbors. This is my beautiful wife, Joan. Okay, so one day you get a phone call and you're asked to give a 15-minute testimony at CCDA. How do you begin to summarize your life and 40 years of working in the city of Chattanooga? How do you decide what to talk about? What should be the focus of your remarks? First, uh, you need to know that we serve as the pastor of New City Fellowship. It's a PCA congregation in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It is a cross-cultural, multi-site congregation of about 1,100 folks, which started as an inner city Sunday school back in 1968. It is committed to the city, to the black community, to the poor, and to the radicalization of middle-class people so that they might be used of God to bless the city. New City has spun off both community development initiatives and urban ministries and several other churches around the country that emulate its model. We call ourselves cross-cultural rather than multi-ethnic because we realize that some multi-ethnic churches can be monocultural even while having various ethnic groups present. New City pursues the African-American community. One of our churches, New City Nairobi in Nairobi, Kenya, is an African church pursuing South Asians who were brought to Africa to build the railroad. One day an Asian said to the African pastor, Joe Matuki, how come you don't love us? He said, you evangelize Africans, but you leave us to be Muslims and Hindus. And that prompted Pastor Matuki's heart. And so they follow that same model. We are thankful to God that he's given us this mission. So, or do you talk about your childhood in, Newark, in the city of Newark, New Jersey, being raised in the projects in two separate but differently dysfunctional homes. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and my family split up when I was four. We moved to Newark, New Jersey, and my mother's life slid downhill, both morally and financially. Soon we were living in the projects, and my mother was on her second pregnancy by a man, not her husband. I was in a single-parent family, on welfare, living in the projects of Newark, New Jersey. Later, my family moved to another housing project across the city, the same neighborhood in which Joan lived. <laughs> I was raised by parents who, during my childhood years, did not know Jesus. Our family was strictly a go to church on Easter and Mother's Day kind of family. My dad was a functioning alcoholic, so though he always held a job, and sometimes more than one job, his behavior put a lot of pressure on my mom, who passed that tension on along to us kids, and there were seven of us. One result of the stresses at work in our family was that I and several of my siblings were victims of sexual abuse at the hands of a friend of my mom, who was sometimes recruited to be our babysitter. It was during my teen years and in the context of that family that I came to believe in Jesus. Or do you talk about your church in Newark and the pastor who trained you in evangelism and encouraged you in your belief that the church should consist of people from different ethnic groups and minister to the poor? Hannah prays in Samuel, you have taken the beggar from the dung heap and made him sit among princes. Jesus has done that for us. We had a wonderful man of God to be our pastor. He was, by the way, a Wheaton College graduate from Wheaton Grad School, a man who believed in evangelizing everyone and who had a passion to disciple young people. He was a natural developer of leaders and a great mentor. He knew little of cross-cultural issues when he began his ministry and he had to learn the hard way through many mistakes and with a lot of confrontation, but he did learn. He had a commitment to the city and urban ministry, and we developed a passion for it as well. Or do you talk about getting married in 1971 across racial lines 
when that same pastor told you that if you married, you would never have a ministry? Our pastor had some blind spots. <laughs> and he was initially opposed to our marriage. The problem was he had trained us to prove our ideas from Scripture. And he had no Scripture. <laughs> and he may have been right. There are undoubtedly churches who did not and would not hire us. But God has called us to start the work we are in. God called us to stay in this work. At first it was small, poor, and hard, and it was also mocked and ridiculed as idealistic and unrealistic. The homogeneous unit principle of church growth says it can't work. Few thought that in the middle of the South such a cross-cultural church could not only survive but thrive. I would never say we are a success. I would only say we are trying. But I will also say that with God, nothing is impossible. Or do you talk about getting involved while still in college with the small mission Sunday school class that grew to become New City Fellowship? I was recruited my senior, my senior year in high school <clears throat> by Covenant College a small Christian college located in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. And this was in 1967, the same year as the first Newark riots. So I went from the Newark riots to Lookout Mountain, Georgia. <laughs> I, was, I was only the second African-American and the first African-American female to attend and graduate Covenant College. It was during my sophomore year that a Sunday school class in the small Presbyterian church I was attending started a Sunday school in a downtown inner city neighborhood after, in Chattanooga after reading Tom Skinner's book, Black and Free. I began to work with them mostly so that I could hang out with black people every week. <laughs> I love working with the children and getting to know their families. To this day, I love telling Bible stories using a flannel graph board. Randy went to Biola College his freshman year, and later transferred to Covenant. We became part of a, an earnest band of believers who wanted to reach across racial and economic lines and win people to Jesus. It was mostly faculty, staff, and students from Covenant who were pretty ignorant about racial, cultural, and justice issues. Joan and I came from an urban background, from an urban church committed to urban evangelism, mercy to the poor, and accepted cross-cultural life as normal. We had been radicalized by the preaching of Tom Skinner. We were involved in various conferences and associations before we came into contact with John Perkins. We attended the Black Students and Christian Colleges Conference. I was a, a guest. Uh, <laughs> the National Black Evangelical Association and even hosted two national conferences on the inner city even while we were still in college. We met John Perkins in 1975 at the National Conference on Race and Reconciliation. And uh, after another year of that conference, John and I and a few people were invited to join uh, Evangelicals for Social Action. We were challenged and trained by learning from John about economic community development. We sort of fell off the conference circuit after going to Africa to pastor a church in Nairobi for a few years and direct a prison fellowship international for Africa. Today, New City in Chattanooga is an activist church. It means to be a player in its community. It means to call its people to not live for themselves, but for others. Joining that church means becoming committed to its vision. Or do you talk about deciding to settle in a small southern city in the 70s to become pastor to a brand new particular church in a Presbyterian white southern denomination. When we left Chattanooga to go to seminary in St. Louis, we really didn't uh, envision going back. We entertained the idea of going into the army chaplaincy, but the elders from Chattanooga came to St. Louis in my senior year and asked us to come back. And we said, if the army doesn't take us, we will come. And Somehow, the Army lost my application for active duty. 
We never thought Chattanooga was the strategic place to be for urban and cross-cultural ministry. We had grown up looking at the New York City skyline from our apartment windows. Yet Chattanooga has always had an intensity of poverty in its inner city, a dysfunctional public school system, a rampant drug and gang problem. When people get to know our church and our ministry, they ask, why are you in the Presbyterian Church in America? And we acknowledge that we are in an overwhelmingly white and middle-class denomination, one which is very politically conservative, one which certainly has its own record of and struggle with racism. We are in it because it is committed to the scriptures. And we don't know any other organization that doesn't have its share of hypocrisy and problems with racism. On the whole, we have been wonderfully loved and supported by the people of our denomination. And now we are looked to as a model of what a church can be. And for that, all we can do is give God the glory because it only happened by his grace and not by our talents. We also know this, for America to be changed, we must affect its majority culture. White people and middle-class people have to be radicalized by a holistic gospel so that true reconciliation can take place. This is daunting, sometimes wearying and frustrating, but we believe the poor need the middle class. Or do you talk about raising four children and watching God work his grace in their lives in four different ways? And now we have the joy of our two, first two grandchildren. We were given the opportunity to adopt our first child while I was five months pregnant with our second. <laughs> Michael came to live with us in January and Garrett was born in May of that same year. We later had another son given and our only daughter, Curran, came last. Our oldest son has struggled with many of the symptoms of attachment disorder, failure to bond. After he gradu graduated from high school, we endured six years of him literally running away from us. Since that time, our relationship has greatly improved by God's grace. He moved back to Chattanooga two years ago with his wife and stepdaughter. We still have issues, but God is enabling us to deal with them. One of the things people ask when you're talking about interracial marriage is, what about the children? <laughs> I guess folks believe they will be crushed by their struggles with identity. And the implication is that they will somehow be inferior to non-mixed race children. And so I will attempt to answer that question here. Our children were raised by two parents in a believing home with as much love as we were able to give them with Jesus' help. They all still love Jesus and they are committed to seeing the gospel lived out in the context of a multiracial church in communities of need. They love being the product of two cultures. They apparently think of themselves of some sort of super race. <laughs> and so we come to this part of our lives committed to Jesus and the gospel, the love he extends to broken people, and believing in the gospel's power to change sinful people, and that the gospel is inherently missional and cross-cultural. We are living examples that God can use broken and sinful people, that he's able to forgive and forgive again, that with all our baggage, and I will tell you that poverty messed us up, but Jesus saved us, and that with all of our baggage, he is still able to build his church, reach the lost, feed the hungry, house the homeless, change the racist, and bring alienated people together into one worshiping community of joy.